Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Spring Church. We are so glad that you are here. It is Memorial Day weekend, and we are counting our blessings. Uh, we are thanking God for the men and women who have given their lives so that we can celebrate the freedoms that we have to worship in this place today. And as we do this during this first song, I would invite you not only to thank God for them, but also for their families and to continue to ask God to bless this great nation.
Well, good morning and welcome to New Spring Church. On a weekend that we remember those who paid, as Abraham Lincoln said, the last full measure of their devotion to give us freedom. We live in a, a very sad culture because we live in a day where patriotism tends to be judged on politics. And I don't know how we got here because no matter where you are on the political spectrum, we need to remember that our mission into this place of worship was paid for by the blood of patriots. And whether you're left, right, center, or off the grid, it's an unthinkable sin not to honor those who paid the price for our freedom. In fact, one of the signs of the last days that the Bible gives is that people will be unthankful. And we don't want that to be us today. And so it's fitting today that we honor those who paid the price for our freedom in the house that we worship God. So I'm going to ask you to do something, and, and you'll see why in just a few seconds. I have a reason for doing this. I'm going to ask you to be seated. What we're about to do is because not only should we honor those who have paid the price personally, it may be that we have some here today who willingly gave up a member of your family to serve and die for our freedom. And we not only want to honor them, we want to thank you for your sacrifice. In World War II, it was a practice in the United States that if a family had a son or daughter serving in the military, there would be a blue star in the window. But when a family lost a member of their family who died serving in a military branch for their country, there would be a gold star. And when you passed a house with a gold star, you would know that family gave up a son or daughter to buy our freedom. So I'm going to ask for something, and I don't know if we have anyone here. I know we did in the last service. But if there's anyone here today and a member of your family gave their life for this country in the service of the military, would you do us the honor and give us the privilege of honoring that member of your family and thanking you would you stand, please, just for a moment, if there is a member of your family who gave their lives for us? sing a song together that's all about who God is. We were far from him. We had a name, but he changed that name and gave us a new name in glory with him. So I want to invite you to kind of groove with us and sing with us as we proclaim that this morning. I was lost in shame, could not get past my flame until he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me, darkness held me down, but Jesus pulled me out, and I'm no longer down. I'm so glad he changed me, see I'm now a new creation in Christ, the old has gone, there's no lie. I live by faith. Now a new 
Because the I am tells me who I am. That's good news. That we can find our identity in Him. In His wonderful, powerful name. That we're going to glorify and sing about in this next song. So I invite you to sing this with me. As morning dawns and evening fades. You inspire songs of praise. That rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name. So we sing, your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, so let the nation sing. That's us. Cause nothing has the power to save. But your name. Who believes that this morning? It's your name. Jesus, in your name we pray to come and feel. You hear me when 
midnight call You are my morning song Though darkness fills the night It cannot hide the light Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy Underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though troubles linger still So whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies He's always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine is so great that he has many names. He reaches out to us with them to show us the many facets of his character. He's inviting us to get to know him. So come and meet God. Well, that is our series name, Meet God, and we're talking about how the God reveals himself by different names because he is such an awesome God that we need to know these different names because of different aspects of his character and his work in the world. We've talked about two verses from the very beginning of our series that kind of give us bookends for why we're talking about this. Because in the book of Hosea chapter 4, when God speaks about the problems that his people have... And by the way, I think all of us are concerned when we look at American Christianity at the problems God's people have. God says, my people are being destroyed because 
They don't know me. Now, we could look at the problems of American Christianity, and we can say, well, it's this and it's that. We'd probably be accurate to some degree, factual at least, but the accuracy lies in the fact that we're failing in many cases because we don't know God as well as we need to know him. The other side of that book in is from the book of Colossians chapter 1 where the Bible says you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. And that's why we're not hurrying through this series because our goal is that we will know God better and better and in the process of knowing God, we will grow. Two weeks ago, I emphasized a statement that we make at New Spring pretty often here, but we didn't come up with it at New Spring. It's just Bible fact. And that statement goes like this. Jesus will take you or he'll receive you as you are. Now, that's true. I mean, it could be that you're here today and you're like, Mark, I don't know what I got to do to my life to get myself worked up to the place where God will accept me. That's kind of the mantra of religion. But here, Jesus will take you as you are is the message of the word of God. Now, let's take the second half of that statement. But he won't leave you as he finds you. It's not surprising that the part of that statement that we love the best is the first part, that Jesus will receive us where we are. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And when we hear that, we recognize that we don't deserve that. Um, we don't deserve anything like that. For Almighty God, Jehovah God, Elohim, El Roy, Jehovah Jireh, for him to receive us just as we are, we, we know that that's something that we could never deserve. And we love that as well we should. But here's the thing. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're born again in a flash. At that very instant when you believe the gospel and you invite Jesus Christ into your life, you were born again at that very moment. But we're going to live a lifetime after that. So today, I just want to tell you, we need to spend more time on the second half of that statement that Jesus will not leave you where he found you. Now, I've been preaching for many years. In fact, I've been preaching since I was 16. And to my knowledge, I've been faithful to preach the word of God. But I got to tell you something. If I were starting over again, I would spend more time on the teaching or the doctrine of sanctification. Now, here's the thing. If, uh, if that word sanctification freaks you out and you hear organ music and you see stained glass, and most of all, you've been weirded out by people who told you that they were sanctified. And, and you know, like, I don't know the difference between sanctified and deep fried, but let me just say this. <laughs> We really need to spend time here. Now, let me start here. I've been a pastor now for many years, and i got to tell you something. Not so much at New Spring, but I spent my ministry dealing with two extremes. And the extremes go like this. The first extreme says, I'm a Christian. I can do anything I want to do. God will forgive me for anything. So consequently, I can do anything I want to do in my Christian life, and God is okay with that. Well, first of all, I'm not dealing with a Christian. I'm dealing with a narcissist. Because anyone who has the idea that they can do anything that they want to do and still be a Christian, they've just failed to understand the gospel. Because, see, the gospel is that God will save me as a sinner. I have to understand that I have a problem with sin before I recognize the importance of what it means to have a Savior. But, to be honest with you, I haven't run into that crowd as much as I've run into the other extreme that I've spent way too much time dealing with, thankfully not at New Spring anymore. Every once in a while, I'll deal with this a little bit. And that is a legalist. And a legalist will demand that saved people, always other people, not themselves, that they not have besetting sins. That's what the Bible calls about. Have you ever noticed that elitists of all stripes will always create straw men? They'll always create a, create a caricature that's absurd, and then they'll knock down that straw man as if that's a real issue. What I've heard legalists do is they will look at any Christian who's struggling with a sin that they're struggling with, and they're saying, well, that person may not be a Christian because if they were a Christian, they would overcome that in their life. Now, there are two problems with legalists. And again, thankfully, I don't deal with them much anymore, but I have dealt with them in the past. The two problems that legalists have is, first of all, they have besetting sins. And if that's a new term to you, let me read it to you out of a couple other different translations. The NIV says the sin that so easily entangles. I like, I like the ESV. It says the sin which clings so closely. Now, let me ask you a question. You don't need to raise your hand, and please don't elbow your husband on this one. But let me ask you a question. Do you have a sin that entangles you easily? Or do you have a sin that clings to you? Now, the Bible says you do, because it wouldn't tell you to lay it aside if you didn't have it. 
Now, yours may be different from mine. Mine may be different from yours. Yours may be different from the person sitting next to you. But everybody is dealing with sin in their lives. And what a legalist will say, a legalist will say, once you accept Christ, if you really know Jesus Christ, then you're just going to overcome that. Well, that's the first problem I have, is I know whenever I deal with a legalist, here's the thing, let me just keep this in your hip pocket. If you ever deal with a hyper-legalist in your life, you always know something, they're hiding something. They're hiding something. And, and consequently, that overactive legalism is their mechanism to hide their sin. And at least they're dealing, you know they're not hiding very well their arrogance and they're not hiding their insecurity. That's pretty well on display. But I just want you to understand something. Just from a guy that's been pastoring for 47 years, I can tell you whenever you deal with a hyper-legalist, just keep in your hip pocket, sooner or later, it'll come out. The second thing is that I want to go to that straw man thing. Because struggling Christians do not believe that they can do anything that they want to do. Now, that's the straw man that legalists create. But struggling Christians don't believe that. And by definition, they don't believe that. Because if they believed that, they wouldn't be struggling. They would just be in that narcissistic thing that I can do anything I want to do. So when you find a Christian who's struggling, you're finding a Christian that doesn't believe that he or she can do anything they want to do. They're just failing and struggling in some particular area of their life. Now, let me just tell you where most Christians are if they feel safe enough to say it. There's a process that happens at the moment when you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you recognize that you've been forgiven and Jesus is your Savior, it is very exciting. I remember I was, when I had assurance of my salvation, I, I was dancing in the room. Now, I closed the door so nobody could see me. But it's just the exuberance, the joy of knowing that I was forgiving, forgiven. But now, here's the thing. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, a battle begins. It's what the Bible calls spiritual warfare. And so after you have that moment of accepting Christ and feeling that rush of joy over being forgiveness, the next thing you know, you're in a battle. And you'll find yourself slipping back into areas where you thought you had gained victory. Now, we don't have to raise our hand, but I'm almost tempted to ask how many here have been at that moment where you thought you got victory over something, and the next thing you know, you're slipping back. Now, we think we've overcome habits. We think... You know, we think we're doing well and that we're growing in God. And then the next thing we know, we're slipping back. Now, then there's a bounce that kind of happens from that moment. Because one day we get up in the morning and we're feeling forgiven. We're feeling like God's child. It's a beautiful day. We're thinking what a joy it is to be a Christian. We're reading some scripture in the Bible. And God is speaking to us. We're in the car on the way to work. We listen to Caleb and good songs are on the radio. And you're just feeling great. Next thing you know, you get to work and the problems start. You find yourself saying a word you thought you didn't say anymore. There's that bounce. And then, you, and then, then of course, Satan comes along and he says, are you, really a, are you really saved? I mean, can a Christian think that? Can a Christian do that? Can a Christian say that? And if you've run into legalists or if you grew up in legalist religion, all of a sudden all the echo chamber of that narcissism and arrogance gets, in, gets into you. Well, that puts us in a place where we can learn a new name for God if we haven't learned it already, and that name is Jehovah Makadish. And this name comes from the book of Leviticus, which is the third book of the Bible, where the word of God says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, remember, I said if I were starting over again, I would talk more about sanctification. This is God saying, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah, Jehovah Makadish, the one who sanctifies you. Now, like I said, for some of you, if you've heard crazy Christians that kind of use that term and got you scared, what does it mean in real terms? What does it mean for God to sanctify you? If you haven't fallen in love with a verse already, I want you to fall in love with this verse today because probably better than any single sentence in the Bible that explains sanctification, I would choose Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Listen, and I'm going to slow it down, so I want to make sure we don't just skate past this. The Bible says God who began the good work within you will continue it. He will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now listen, New Spring, there are four massive life-altering truths in that statement. They're going to revolve around four words. And I want us to just take those out and savor them for just a moment. Here's the first one. God who began, began. Now, if you've ever accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you recognize that that is God's work in your life. You were a sinner. You came by faith. You came just as you were. 
And on the blood of Jesus Christ, you trusted him as your Lord and Savior, and God worked. Right, God worked in you. You didn't do that. You can't do that. God began his work in you. But begin is the key word because, see, the thing of it is, when God forgave you, saved you, adopted you into his family, that was just the beginning of his work in your life. I'm sure the preachers didn't intend it, but when I was a kid, I listened to a lot of sermons that went something like this, at least in my mind. I probably heard it wrong. But I had the idea that they were saying that God will forgive you. He'll start you out in salvation, but after that, you're on your own. It's kind of like if somebody gave you a car and said, uh, here's the keys. I bought you a car. I got you a car. And then when you... When they went on, they just said, well, really, all I did was make a down payment. Here are the next 72 payments that you have to pay. Now, I'm sure, like I said, the preachers didn't mean that, but that's kind of what I heard. But here's the beauty. When God saved you, he was just beginning a work that was going to, and here's the next word, continue, continue. He who began a good work in you will continue. Continue means he keeps working every day. He worked yesterday in your life. He's working today in your life. He's working tomorrow in your life. You live 10 years from now and Jesus doesn't come. He'll be working every day in your life. He will continue that work. And then the third work, uh, third word, I think is my favorite word, until. What that word says is he won't stop. He'll just keep working and he'll work until. And then finally, I love the word when, because the word when tells us that his work will be finished when we see Jesus face to face. Someone will say, Mark, when you say that God is working, I think I feel that. I think I know God's presence in my life, but look, I just want to dial this in. What specifically is God doing in my life? When I got saved, I know what he did. He forgave me, adopted me into God's family. But today as he's working in my life, in real terms, what does that mean? Okay, I want you to turn if, in your mind at least one chapter further in the book of Philippians to chapter 2 in the 13th verse. The Bible says God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That's what, if you want to feel this, if you want to, if you want to recognize God's work in your life of sanctification, it comes down to those two things, that God is giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Now, I get asked this every once in a while. Someone will say, well, Mark, how can I know if I'm really saved? Well, I want to give you, a, there, there are some things in the Bible that are good evidence. Let me just give you a one question test. I have ADD. I like one question tests. Do you have a desire to please God? Because you can be listening to this message today and you're like, what time is lunch? And this idea of pleasing God is not important to me. I'm not saying that you're lost. I'm just saying, hmm. But if you desire to please God, I mean, you, you may say, Mark, I'm failing in 10 different ways, but I love God and I want to please God. You didn't get that from the devil. You didn't get that from yourself. You got that because the spirit of God is working in your life, giving you the desire to please him. So today, if you have a desire to please the Lord in your heart, according to the word of God, and that's what I go by, the Bible says God is working in your life, giving you the desire now, somebody could say, well, Mark, I have the desire to please God, but I'm not sure I have the strength to please God. Now, think about something for just a moment. Isn't, doesn't it make sense that you're going to get the desire first and then the power? Because, you see, that's the only way, that, that's the only way we would know what we need to have in our life. So, and, and you say, well, Mark, I, just, I feel like a failure because I want to please God, but I keep coming up short. Listen, you're not the only one to feel that way. Outside of Jesus Christ, I would assume the greatest Christian in the world is the same guy the Holy Spirit inspired to write the book of Philippians. Here's what he said about himself in Romans 7. He said, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, that is good to hear from coming from Paul. So, the, so, so, okay, Mark, what is the answer? We just read a moment ago that God is working in my life, giving me the desire and the power to please God, but I've got more desire than I feel like I have power. You learned this in, ed, you learned this in elementary school. What does an ing ending mean on the end of a verb? It means it's ongoing action. It means it's progressive. So do you hear that today? God is working in your life, giving, working, giving you the desire and the power to please him. So if God is giving you the desire, you know that God is going to give you the power. He's going to give you the strength to do that. Now this, 
So this, this is a process that's ongoing. So I don't know, I, what do I have? I have about 15, 18, 24 minutes. <laughs> Finish this. Jehovah Makadish, the God who sanctifies me, what can we learn that will help us today? Well, I'm not a theologian, but theologians like to use three words to talk about God's work of sanctifying us in our lives. There is that initial work of salvation, and then there is the ongoing work of sanctification, and then there is that day when we will be in the presence of God and we'll be fully sanctified. The th three words that theologians like to use are positional sanctification, practical sanctification, progressive sanctification, and perfect sanctification. So let's just kind of unpack those and see what they mean in real terms in our lives that we can use. Let's talk about positional sanctification. That is the moment when you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, forgiven, adopted, saved, justified. Got to be clear on something. You have no ability to do any of that. That is all the work of God through Jesus Christ and his work for us. Someone will say, well, you know, it is interesting to me how people, you, okay, watch, watch something about legalists, okay? Watch this, because they, they're just a pain in the neck. <laughs> You know, they're, they're, they're like, well, you know what? You know, this idea about God saving you by his grace. And they'll say this. I'm not talking about works now. Well, usually when somebody says that, it's like someone saying it's not about the money. Because it is. I want to tell you something. You, you, before you came to faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you were dead in trespasses and sin. The only way you could become saved, adopted, regenerated, justified in the presence of God is the work of Jesus Christ and him alone. And there's nothing. It would be like going to a state dinner at the White House and you walking in with a Tupperware. Do we still use that anymore? A Tupperware of cold pork and beans to say, this dinner's not complete till I bring these pork and beans. They would kick you out. And that's what happens with a lot of people that uh, want to add something to salvation. Listen, guys, the only, thing you can, the only thing you can do is trust God, believe God, take God at his word, and invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Now, let me show you a verse that says it way better than I do. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, listen to this, please. This is great. For by a single offering, what is that single offering? That's the cross. By a single offering, he has, look at the next verb, perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That is a massive verse. That is a mountain peak verse in the Bible because it tells me positionally where I am with God even though practically I'm not there yet. Even though I'm still down here on earth struggling to grow as a Christ follower by one offering, not by something Mark did, but by one offering. He has what? He has perfected me in the presence of God. And not just for today. If I fail tomorrow, notice that he has perfected me for all time. And who has he perfected? He's perfected those who have trusted Christ. And day by day, their lives are being changed and turned more into the presence of Christ. It's called positional sanctification because it changes our position. Somebody walks into a courtroom under an indictment. The judge says not guilty when he bangs or she bangs the gavel. And he walks down the steps. He's no different, but his position has been changed legally. When Jesus died on the cross and he said at the end of that, Tate Telestai, it is finished. And Mark is an eight-year-old boy, frail and flawed and broken as he is. When Mark invited Jesus Christ into his life, God, according to the word of God, by one sacrifice has perfected him forever, even though he's still in the process of being sanctified in the courts of heaven. When you see the name Stephen Mark Hoover right under that, it will say, see the record of Jesus Christ. His position has changed. Listen to the word of God. Everyone, I love those everyone's and whoever's, don't you? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And someone will say, well, what if something changes? What if that person fails? Do you trust Jesus? 
Do you trust him to tell you the truth? Man, forget about me. Forget about anything anybody else has ever told you. Just listen to Jesus. Whoever, I love those, whoever hears my word. Have you heard the word of God? And believes. Do you believe him who sent me? May someday get eternal life. Ooh, I misquoted something, didn't I? You remember when you were in grammar and you had to learn the meaning of verbs? You know, when it's present tense and future tense and past tense? Notice that the Bible does not say, Jesus didn't say, whoever hears my word and believes on him and sent me may get eternal life. The word is has. So if you heard the word of God and you believed in Jesus, you have. But what do you have? You have eternal life. Well, what if I do something wrong? And maybe I could lose that. Well, you wouldn't have eternal life. You'd have term life. <laughs> Man, isn't it time we stopped listening to religion and just started listening to Jesus? Yeah. And somebody will say, Mark, are you sure about that? Because it could be that I could just do something so wrong that God would just kick my stuff out to the curb and disown me. It happens in our world, doesn't it? But I want you to hear once again the words of Jesus. He said, all, isn't it amazing? We keep running into these whosoevers and, and alls. All who the Father gives me will come to me. And Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And that's why we say that Jesus will take you as you are but we're talking about Jehovah Makadish today, the God who won't leave you like he found you. So let's talk for a few moments about progressive sanctification. Now we're talking about after we know that our standing in heaven has been changed, but we're still down here on terra firma and we're trying to live out a life that pleases God. So here's the beautiful thing that the God who began the work back at the moment you invited him into your life, he's going to continue it day by day. Now, I would love to just talk for hours about this, but let me just give you some scriptures that are especially important to my life. Okay, in John chapter 17, I always feel like I should take my shoes off because I feel like I'm on holy ground. You got one member of the Trinity talking to another member of the Trinity. This is the night of Jesus' arrest. He is praying what we call the high priestly prayer. And in that prayer, Jesus is not only praying for his disciples, hear this, he's praying for all the people who are gonna be one through their faith, their teaching, their testimony throughout the years. So ultimately, he's praying for you and me because we qualify for that. Now, here's what he said. He said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, here's the thing. If I want to cooperate with God and I want, to be, I want my sanctification to draw me closer to Jesus, I'm going to have to have truth. See, you and I live in a world today where Christians have all kinds of junk food and it's an inhibitor to sanctification. You know, I know you have a lot of young parents here at New Spring. It could be that you have a kid and your kids just says to you, I don't want to eat broccoli. I don't want to eat green beans. I don't want to eat carrots. I like Krispy Kreme. <laughs> and so if you ask them what the menu should be tonight, they think it should be Krispy Kreme and chocolate ice cream and candy. Now, could a child do that? Yeah. Would they be healthy? No. So that's why you have to say as a parent, no, you don't need that. That's not, that's junk food. Now, a lot of us who understand that really well with our kids, we're not sure, we don't understand it too well with ourselves. I, I, there are so many Christians today that are so addicted to entertainment. And I know it, maybe it has its place, but here's the thing. If I want my sanctification to grow, I've got to listen to Jesus. In the, in, when he was praying to his father, he said, Father, sanctify Mark with truth. Your word is truth. So if I want to grow to be more like Jesus, and I want to cooperate with God in this progressive sanctification. I need to get as much of God's word in my life as I possibly can, which is why you're here this morning. That's why Mary Alice and I do something called Noah's Window, where every day we're in the word of God. That's why we have all these wonderful opportunities at New Springs. Why your kids back there learning that Jesus wants to be their best friend because it's truth. So that's, that's an important verse. Let me give you another 
And notice there are three areas, according to this verse, where we need God's work of progressive sanctification in our lives. This is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's interesting that it's right after God's talking about the rapture. So I almost wonder if our generation needs this more than any other generation. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you are a trichotomy. You may not feel that today, but you're a trichotomy. You're a body, soul, and spirit. Spirit is that part of you that is an apparatus for communication with God. Spirit is a part of you that worships. And then soul, that's your mind, that's your thinking. And then body, that's what we do in the body. That's activity. That would be things like your sex life, just how, how, we, how we use our bodies. Now, here's what the scripture says. God's work of sanctification needs to be in all three areas of our lives. We want to cooperate with him in this area of worship. We want to cooperate. How many of us need God to sanctify our thinking? Hmm. Now, let me give you one more. I'm running out of time, but now I want to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. Now, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood that sealed, ratified, I'm reading out of the Amplified, you can tell, the everlasting agreement, that's God's work in, through Christ and salvation, strengthen and make you what you ought to be and equip you with everything good that you may carry out his will. I see, I want that. I want God to strengthen and work in my life. Why? So that I can fulfill the spiritual destiny that God's Holy Spirit has for me. So that I can, you know, I've always told you this. I hate to leave money on the table, but I don't want to ever leave destiny on the table. Well, I need to close this. Let's just talk briefly about perfect sanctification. I won't talk about this much. We'll talk about it in Clash 5. Perfect sanctification is when we're in the presence of of the Lord, and we are fully like Jesus. First John chapter three, verse two. Dear friends, now, May 2024, now we are the children of God. Positional sanctification. Now we are the children of God. What we shall be has not yet been made known, but we know when he appears, Jesus. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, I don't have time to develop this today, but in the book of 2 Corinthians, the Bible tells us that we are transformed by beholding the Lord day by day in our progressive sanctification. But when we are in the presence of God, we'll be fully transformed. Wouldn't that be wonderful to just look at yourself in the mirror and see the character of Jesus being there? One of the main questions I've been asked for the years, even since I was a teenage preacher, as people have asked me, Mark, do you think when I get to heaven I'll know my relatives? I think we'll be at least as smart there as we are here, don't you think? But not being, I'm not trying to be trite. I've often thought that the hardest person I'm going to have to recognize is me. I've never known me without anxiety. I've never known me without the part of me that can take two steps forward and one step back. But it's going to be something someday to realize that I am like Jesus. Because, see, that's when God's work of sanctification is finally finished. It starts as a flawed, broken sinner who comes recognizing that he needs Jesus or she needs Jesus. There's a progression that takes place all the time, day by day, until finally we step into the presence of God Look into his face, and we will be like him. Okay, it's time to close. Let me leave you with four thoughts. Boy, in the last service, I said, let me leave you with five thoughts, and I held up four fingers. Let's just, <laughs> four thoughts. Here's number one. These are big, and I'll go through them fast. Understand the battle. Familiar, familiarize yourself with how this works. You have to tell yourself, I am going to struggle because it is a battle. And I've talked to some of those people that just say, oh, man, I'm just binding Satan and flying over everything. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you're having a good day. <laughs> you are going to struggle. It is a battle. You're going to, every day of your life, fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. But God is working. 
And thought number one, I need to submit to the process. I need to understand what's going on. And if I fail, I recognize what's happening. I'm in, a, I'm, in, I'm in the work of God that's day by day. And if I fail today, I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to get right with God. And I'm going to start over tomorrow knowing that the God who is working in me will still be working in me tonight at 6 o'clock and tomorrow at 6 o'clock in the morning. I understand the battle. I know how it works. <laughs> Number two, I want you to breathe this in right now. Breathe in. I'm not fighting this battle by myself. God is working in my life. Angel armies are out there. I am not in this by myself. Now, please listen to me. I grew up in church. I've been in church all my life. And I've just listened to something. I'll tell you what Satan would like to get you believing more than anything else. He would like to get you believing God is on the other side and you're on this side. You're on opposite sides. And God is over there with a checkbook or with a checklist. And he's checking off you and saying, you did this wrong. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. Now, God is aware of what we're doing. I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. But a lot of Christians have the idea God is over there and I'm over here and I'm failing. So therefore, he must be my enemy. You have heard the word of God today. That God is working in your life and he's not on opposite sides from you. If Satan can ever convince you that God is on the other side, he will keep you splashing around in guilt. And that will not produce holiness. It'll produce despair. Number three. <laughs> remember that the more you make progress, remember that the closer you get to God, the more imperfections you are going to spot. I remember uh, when I got my first car that the roof opened. I think I shaved just fine. I'd get out in the sunlight and I'd open up the roof and it looked like a teenage boy that hadn't learned to shave yet. Because you see, the light of the sun was much brighter than the light in my bathroom. Now, when you start your progress of sanctification, you'll tend to judge yourself by other people. And there'll be times when you think, I'm doing pretty well. Oh, I tell you what, you get into the presence of the S-O-N and his light is brighter than any light that shines on this earth. And you'll begin to spot stuff you didn't even know was wrong. And now you're going to say, "Ooh, God wants to take me to another level. So don't be, don't be discouraged by that. Turn around and look how far God has brought you. You know, someone said, I may not be what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. One more thought and I'm finished. I don't know who I'm talking to today. You could be in South, you could be in North, you could be on television, watching online. I want to talk to a Christ follower who feels like you're just never going to get there. And the enemy has told you, we, do we, use, we don't do this anymore. The enemy has told you, <laughs> you're just going to be a loser. And you know what? Here's the thing about it. You, you won't tell anybody about this. You won't tell your wife or your husband or your pastor. It's just something that in one of those dark nights of the soul where you've just failed God one more time, that you begin to think maybe this Christian life is for other people. I know I'm saved, but I guess I'm just going to enter heaven a loser. That is not God's voice you're hearing. That's Satan's voice you're hearing. There's no reason to give up when God guarantees the outcome. When God has said in his word that he who began a good work in you will continue it until the day Christ Jesus returns. You understand he is never going to kick your stuff out to the curb. He is never going to say, that's it. You've reached your quota. You're out of here. I'm sorry I ever saved you in the first place. God is going to keep working in your life. And somebody will say, well, now, wait a minute, Mark. And especially, I don't think we have any legalists here, but if we did, somebody will say, wait a minute, Mark. I just think that kind of thinking causes people, and remember the straw man? I think that causes people not to be holy. I want to tell you something. Well, okay, let me work with me for a second. All of you who are in love, I want to give you a couple of scenarios and you tell me 
which one would make you a better wife or better husband? Scenario number one. The person that you're in love with says, here is what you have to do. I'm giving you a checklist. And you got to do these things. Because if you don't do these things, you're out of here. Now, in the mind of legalism, it'd be like, well, that person will behave pretty well because they're terrified they're going to get kicked out. On the other hand, suppose the person you're in love with says, I love you no matter what. And of all the women in the world, I want you. Of all the men in the world, I want you. And I'm here. I'm here on your bad days and I'm here on your good days. And I'm not going anywhere. You tell me which one of those two is going to make you want to do everything you can for that other person. You understand now why when the God of creation looks down at frail, flawed, broken people like you and me. And he says, I love you no matter what. And I'm not going anywhere. You put your faith and trust in my son, Jesus Christ. And I love you and nothing can ever change that. And I'll never kick you out. Which one of those causes us to say, oh God, I want to please you. I want to know you. I want my life to reflect what you want to do in my life. You know the answer to that. You know the answer to that. He who began a good work in you will continue it until the day when Christ Jesus returns. He is Jehovah Makadish. Thank you for listening. If you're here today and over and over time, you're here today and you're like, Mark, you talked about that positional sanctification of how God would take me in a flash and forgive me, change my standing. That's true. And you, you saw the scripture, whoever believes, here, here's God's word, believes. Whoever calls, and that could be you today. If you're here at New Spring or watching on television, watching online, it could be you. It's one of those whoever's. And today, if you want that to happen in your life, you can. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. These are not magic words. Saying these words will not, repeating these words, that, that won't save you. But meaning them and believing the message, God will hear your prayer. I want you to pray with me, please. You, let's just all bow our heads. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. but I believe your word. I believe you love me. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he was raised from the grave. And I ask you to forgive me and make me your child. Start this wonderful work in my life. I want off my road. My road's not leading anywhere. I want to be on God's road. And give me the strength to live a life that only you can give me the strength for. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I have a gift I want to give you. It's no charge, no strings attached. There's a New Spring Bible, just like I preach from, a book I wrote called My New Walk with God that'll answer a whole lot of questions. If you're watching online or television, there's a way to get this. Just text the word PRAYED, P-R-A-Y-E-D, to 97,000. Follow the steps and we'll mail it. But if you're here on campus, you don't have to wait. Just go to any info center and say, I pray with Mark. God bless you. Thank you. We'll see you next weekend.